hit something with my foot, and I look down, and there's a giant bottle of whiskey uh, <laughs> next to my right foot, and I, um, I don't know what to think about the absence of it here. Anyway, I didn't know it was before. It was, it was for before the talk or after, so I don't know if the absence now expresses a, an increase or decrease in my expositional abilities. But, but anyway, um, I don't have it to work with, so you guys will bear with me while I drink whatever Starbucks has, has put in this. Um, I suppose it wouldn't be wrong to, I, never wrong, to start out with some gratitude. I, I really appreciate, um, well, just practical things. Pamela and Josh were great this morning. Thank you. And um, what's um, been created here um, over the years, uh, Sandy and, uh, and the, sort of the mainstays of ALS, everyone's still here, uh, and the Onzels, um, certainly. Um, so much, not just aid, but encouragement. Um, I can't go on about it. I thought maybe the, the, the coolest way to not use a bunch of my talk but still be grateful is to have some kind of like NASCAR Formula One jacket with all the patches, you know, of all the people that have, that have helped. Um, so I, I suppose that raises the, the question of um, aid and encouragement for what? So what's the project? This is a piece, I'll be talking about a piece of a project that is an attempt to turn Levinas from sort of an object of study into an advert. Um, and embedded and plant him in analytic literature that a lot of times runs into trouble and you, you, you'll sort of, it's like shouting at the screen about the guys going to the basement, don't do it, right? You, you know, he's going down there, you know what's going to happen, you can hear the music. Um, and so sometimes analytic philosophy will run into these problems and you really feel like Levinas is just speaking to that. Um, so the idea is, but you don't want to scare them off by capitalizing something or saying the hand or, um, you know, whatever, um, infinite responsibility or infinity of the glory of the infinite, God forbid, right? Um, so th there's a very careful way to do this. And so this is pretty much my project, and, and, and this is a chunk of that. So um, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, so analytic philosophers often appeal to reason and reasons uh, to explain ethics. By Levinasian lines, this is backwards. It is not because we are already open to reason that we are ethically open to others. Rather, it is through the welcoming of others that the will opens to reason. It is not that we have reasons to be for the other. Rather, Levinas says, the one for the other is reason. The implications of Levinas' project for reason-centered analytic philosophy are nothing short of Copernican. Yet after three decades in English, the practical impact of Levinas' project on analytic philosophy has been decidedly less than Copernican. Why? A large part of the answer is this. When analytic philosophers ask how a claim of reason could result from a claim of ethics, they are quite properly referred to the face, only to find the face itself inexplicable. And the passages in which Levinas refers to the face as otherness, alterity, and exposure to wounds and outrage appear to analytic investigators as rhapsodies or continental catechisms, poetically rich and propositionally poor. I think uh, Diane, in her book, calls them um, Weather Chestnuts of the Levinas Industry. Um, so uncharitable, perhaps, but, but I think uh, very close to the truth. So this rejection on the analytic side is too often met by repetition, hard to distinguish from assertion. But to assert is not to explain. To say that the face, qua otherness and exposure, commands us is not to show how it has this effect. But without an account of how the face generates ethical obligation, there can be no account of how we are open to reason by it. If we do not say how the face provokes an original ethical imperative, we cannot very well say how the ethical response to this provocation produces so much as a single feature of reason. This halt to Levinas' Copernican, uh, Copernicanism about reason is unnecessary. We can explain how the face does what it does, using resources Levinas himself provides. I'll here show how we can describe both the nature of the face's alterity and explain how the ethical imperative proceeds from it. First, I'll locate a relevant alterity already active in analytic philosophy. Second, I'll show what the face is. I know that's a dangerous formulation, but I'll go with it for now. Um, by showing what its alterity is made of, namely physical vulnerability. Third, I'll show how this unique vulnerability produces the aboriginal, irresistible ought of responsibility. 
This will show at least, or at least, the beginnings of the end game, which is to show how the face permits us to recharacterize as irreducibly ethical the space of reasons itself. So, uh, this is the second, second point here. Alterity is threat. Um, so this is going to look at how alterity is generally treated in analytic philosophy. Alterity is by no means an alien concept to analytics, but while for Levinas alterity inaugurates ethics, in analytic ethics, alterity primarily appears as an obstacle, which it is the very work of ethics to overcome. To see how alterity might appear as an obstacle to ethics, picture a scenario involving only two elements. The first element is, you are suffering terribly. The second is, I do not care. We gasp at the audacity of an ethical indifference so baldly expressed, but part of our breathlessness comes from how hard it is to come up with the right sort of reasons to combat it. In my insistence on a reason to care about your plight, am I irrational to ask for a reason? Or too rational? Either way, I seem to be overlooking something. Can't you see I'm suffering? you say to me. But what exactly am I failing to see? It is not that I cannot see you suffering. That I see perfectly fine. It is not that I cannot see how suffering might be a reason. I certainly see that you have a reason to relieve your suffering. What I cannot see is how your suffering becomes my reason to relieve it. Even more discouraging, it seems that whatever you say, I might very well stand my ground. I might say, yeah, I see you suffering there. I see the fact that you suffer. But what is your suffering to me? How is your suffering my reason? Ethics can be seen as an attempt to answer this one simple question asked with the cold soberness of Cain. To understand, then, the mainstream analytic response to this challenge, note first the strange reason I seem to be giving for my indifference, namely that your suffering is yours and not mine. That your suffering is yours in this way functions as a reason for my indifference, even though I accept that suffering can be a reason to the one whose suffering it is. But you alone are suffering. This seems to me your suffering is a reason to you alone. Alterity, understood here as separateness, evidenced in suffering, in this way explains how it might be reasonable for me to be indifferent to every agony but my own. I, I don't have anybody to put in mind a human, right? It is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of my finger. Right. Uh, it's a wonderful formulation. Um, so there has been a near unanimous strategic response to this scenario, namely to degrade the ethical importance of alterity. Two tactics employed in pursuit of this strategy are especially familiar. The first is the tactic of empathy. TE, uh, the tactic of empathy, proposes to prevent ethical indifference by dissolving affective distance. To do this, TE must show that our feelings are in fact shared, and hence, so are our sufferings. TE argues we cannot be as ethically estranged as the skeptic supposes, because we are affectively connected. Empathy, or something like it here, plays the crucial role of transcribing shared feelings into shared reasons, via various versions of this encouraging syllogism. One, your feelings are reasons for you. Two, through empathy, I share and so feel your feelings. Three, through empathy, I share your reasons. And so we find Spinoza in book three of, of his ethics. Quote, from the fact that we imagine a thing like ourselves to be affected by an emotion, we are affected by a similar emotion along with it. Others who take this affective avenue to undermine alterity include Wittgenstein-inspired literature against the privacy of pain, some contemporary empathy theorists, and their predecessor sympathy theorists, like Adam Smith and David Hume. The primary aim here is to render the possessives of pain, of my pain, your pain, uh, ethically irrelevant. For this would render unethical, unreasonable, or both any indifference which, like mine, appeals to these possessives. The second tactic of degrading the import, ethical importance of difference I'll call the tactic of reason. TR, the tactic of reason, also attacks the ethical importance of the possessors of pain. But in contrast to TE, TR does not work to diminish or deny the distinctness of the pain and suffering of different persons. Instead, it denies the relevance to reason of the distinctness of the persons possessing the pain. <clears throat> 
Most variations, especially the Kantian ones, look something like this. Some reasons, one, some reasons attached to me qua reasoner. These are ethical reasons. Two, qua reasoner, you are no different from me. Therefore, three, we do not have different ethical reasons. The absence of any relevant difference between my rational nature and yours renders any attempt to base my actions on the difference between us unreasonable. This indiscernibility of reasoners for TR is not a bug but a feature. Kant insists, quote, it will be possible to think of a kingdom of ends only if one abstracts from the personal differences of rational beings. Respect for particular persons derives from respect for the universal humanity. Alterity only has ethical significance after and in the context of, quote, a humanity of interchangeable men. In both cases, sameness is sensibly seen as the antidote to an ethically threatening alterity. If difference can be a reason for indifference, we have an ethical reason to produce philosophies degrading its normative importance. Right. So, that's uh, three here. Pre-ethical alterity. So this is starting to, to get at um, what I think uh, the kind of alterity we can use to get this um, picture that they started. So Levinas believes these two tactics are not really wrong but unmotivated. The problem isn't that these attempts fail. It is that to attempt them signifies a prior philosophical failure. The failure is the failure to see that it is not as similar, the same, or in virtue of the common that we are ethically obliged. Rather, it is, quote, paradoxically, as foreigner and other, that man is not alienated. Oddly, then, Levinas' disagreement with the entire anti-alterity strategy implies an agreement with me, the skeptical challenger who didn't care about your suffering at all. I am, thinks Levinas, not wrong to think that the possessives of pain indicate an alterity of the greatest ethical significance. Nor am I wrong, thinks Levinas, about what these possessives signify, namely, an ethically important privacy of pain. What I am wrong about, says Levinas, is what of ethical significance follows from these possessors and the terrible privacy they indicate. I, skeptic, suppose the difference of our sufferings could serve as a reason for indifference. On the contrary, Levinas holds it is precisely, quote, difference between the one and the other, which turns into non-indifference. I, a skeptic, appeal to our alterity to release me from responsibility. Levinas counters with the relation uh, that, quote, the relation with alterity is ethical proximity, and proximity is understood as responsibility. Alterity, then, does not undermine ethics at all. It somehow turns into it. Ethics and otherness are not at odds. Ethical proximity, understood as responsibility, is what alterity becomes. It follows from these phrases of transition and transformation that there is a pre- or proto-ethical alterity with which we are confronted. An alterity which, turning into and becoming proximity, is not itself ethical yet. There is a face presupposed by the meaning of faces. The face is that with which we come face-to-face. -face. So it is in some way before the face-to-face. -face. It is this pre- or proto-ethical alterity of the face which turns into responsibility, uh, which I'll now try to describe. So, uh, alterity and agony. Uh, that shows you I care because there's alliteration there, right? Wow. Um, so I'll begin by asking this important, um, albeit naive, question. What is the face's alterity made of? So we have two faces. What is the difference? Levinas' answer is vulnerability. Um, the essence of his answer. Uh, moreover, he claims the relationship between alterity and vulnerability is as follows. Vulnerability is not merely conjoined with alterity in the face. Rather, vulnerability somehow constitutes the face's alterity. The face is, quote, pure vulnerability, quote, an exposure to wounds and outrage. And alterity is made of this vulnerability and exposure. If this is right, then in the face-to-face, -face, the vulnerability to suffering of the other is the alterity we are facing. Taking this line requires we find in Levinas an alterity or otherness made of a perpetual exposure to suffering. And this is exactly what we find, particularly in transcendence and evil and useless suffering. In the latter essay, Levinas launches an investigation into the relation between my suffering 
and my suffering over your suffering, a project which presupposes an account of suffering simplicity. When we combine the insights of these essays, Levinas claims suffering is at least three things. Suffering is first, inherently revulsive, second, utterly isolated, and third, intrinsically unjustifiable. Now, for those of us interested in the reasons suffering might give, the last item, unjustifiability, stands out. <clears throat> it is normal to apply this predicate to uh, specific cases of the act of imposing suffering on others, or, as in our opening case, not acting to alleviate. But it seems odd to say that suffering itself could be justified or unjustified. For what has justification to do with a physiological event? How might, say, malaria, a cancerous growth, or cardiac arrest themselves be unjustifiable? Isn't the attempt to apply the concept unjustifiable to cramps or collapsed lungs a category mistake? How could it make sense even to try to justify it? In claiming, then, it is sens that it is sensible to say suffering is unjustifiable, Levinas sets himself, or sets us, perhaps, a two-part puzzle. First, he must show suffering is indeed the sort of thing which we might sensibly expect to be justified. I'll call this the expectation problem. Second, he must show it is systematically unable to be justified. I'll call this the frustration problem. Levinas' account of suffering must be such that suffering can solve both problems. It must have both the remarkable power to evoke in us the expectation it should be justified, and an equal and opposing power to absolutely frustrate every justification. <clears throat> so, to start, the first piece of the puzzle, the expectation of the justification of suffering, appears in his discussion of how suffering isolates. Suffering, says Levinas, is a setting apart from others. Suffering institutes, quote, a distinction in pain, so far as to amount to exile, placing the sufferer, quote, beyond the community of the common. This already sounds like an alterity of some sort. Yet, for Levinas, this isolation is more than misfortune. He begins, not yet to explain, but to describe the sense of frustration that comes with it. Suffering, he argues, seems not to saunter into my path, but rather arrives, quote, as though it sought me out. Suffering reaches me as if it had been reaching for me. Yet this directed malevolence of agony is also arbitrary, for there seems no reason for this singling out for suffering. No answer to the natural query, why me? Suffering thus presents not as an event, but as an election. Not as mere pain, but as persecution. Levinas' connotations here are clear. You do not seem in suffering to be merely subject to the isolating power of pain. There is already, in agony's isolating power, the aura of unjust subjection. So, having in this way granted the skeptical premise that we suffer separately, and analyze the imperative and arbi apparently arbitrary nature of this separation, Levinas then directly contradicts what both the skeptic and his same the sinner critics suppose must follow. Levinas concludes not that the different sufferings justify indifference. He does not conclude that separation and suffering leads to a cane-like shrug of the skeptic. Quite the contrary. He concludes that this very alterity and agony is precisely what results in proximity, understood as responsibility. Uh, there's some nuances with how responsibility gets used um, uh, through the various books, but I'm, I'm going to ramble over those in the interest of time. Um, moreover, the responsibility arises not in spite of, but precisely because you are suffering and because you suffer alone. It is your extreme passivity, helpless abandonment, and solitude. It is, quote, the half-opening of a moan, a cry, a groan, which itself constitutes, quote, the original call for aid. And this call comes not from a shared feeling or shared status as reasoners, but, quote, from the other, whose alterity, not similarity, calls for salvation. In short, out of this notion of suffering as isolation, <coughs> intentional malignance, and unjustifiability, let us claims we get ethics. From your very alterity, your aloneness in facing the arbitrary malevolence of agony, from the very intractability of the possessors of pain, quote, a beyond appears in the form of the injured human. Okay, so that's uh, a quite a wind-up. I drew a long bow, but here um, in section 5 we get to the face, or the account of the face and how it does it. So, 
There's much that is phenomenological here, but Levinas has already provided enough for, not merely a description, but an explanation of the face. He has given us enough to show how our responsibility for one another arises from alterity, where this alterity is analyzed as human vulnerability. I'll put this explanation of how the face does what it does in terms of, not a causal, but a normative mechanism. Uh, the normative mechanism whereby difference turns into indifference, separation into solidarity, and alterity into proximity has two parts. One part from our physicality, the other from our rationality. I'll here argue that a recognizably Levinasian responsibility results from perpetual opposition or perhaps better, a practical antinomy between these two parts. First up is the bodily part of the mechanism. This part is derived from Levinas' considerations on the nature of suffering. There, we learned that, first, suffering isolates. Even if one share, uh, suffers something in common, there is nothing common in the suffering of it. Let pain be ever so public, the suffering of pain is something terribly private, intimate, proprietary, and personal. For however common the experience of, of pain, that, that the pain that is undergone may be, there is nothing shared or shareable in the undergoing of it. Second, we learn that suffering imposes. This is to say, it has an imperative aspect. Suffering subjects, uh, suffering subjects the sufferer to a unique and terrible demand. For one does not merely have suffering, one must handle it. One must do something in response to it, um, and to the imperative of suffering issues. Your suffering says, undergo this, deal with this, bear this. And it issues this unrefusable commission of cross to no one but you. The phenomenology of suffering in this way involves a strange kind of imperative. For the imperative to handle or undergo suffering is an utterly individual one. It is, as Levinas calls mortality, a dread commission, a singular, quote, assignation or obligation. So I am in suffering perpetually subjected, not just to suffering, but to the imperative to undergo it. Here the isolation and imperative aspects of suffering merge. Suffering is not merely isolating and imperative. It is precisely the imperative of suffering that constitutes its isolation. So, this analysis of suffering as imperative provides us a sensible answer to the first part of the puzzle I raised earlier, the expectation problem. Given the above analysis, wherein suffering is undergone not as a mere event but as an imperative, suffering does appear as the sort of thing to which justifying reasons pertain. <coughs> mere physical events can't be justified or unjustified, but imperatives can. And evaluating imperatives as justified or not is a central business of reason. So our initial result is as follows. If suffering is undergone as an imperative, it follows that it will seem to be something to which the predicates just or unjustified might apply. Thus suffering, where its phenomenology is imperatively understood, can come into contact or conflict with reason, and so into contact or conflict with what seems reasonable to us. Agony interacts with rationality. Suffering gets a grip on reason by taking the form of something upon which reason usually gets a grip. However, uh, Levinas claims more than its suffering's imperative aspect shows it to be the sort of thing that seems capable of being justified. He also claims it is incapable of being justified. And this is the second part of the puzzle I call the frustration problem. Even accepting that suffering itself qualifies for justification as, as we have, we need an account of how suffering though always presenting like something that ought to be justifiable, nevertheless, never is. Excuse me, it's a heavy breathing here. I have a hard time finding the right distance for this thing. Um, so, given how suffering expects or evokes justification, how does it absolutely resist it? To work with here, we have the idea that suffering is experienced as an imperative, and that imperatives are the sort of thing that the reason justifies. So in our investigation into suffering's unjustifiability, we have the following tactic. We can, as a broader question about what would make any imperative unjustifiable, uh, we can take up as a broader question what would make any imperative unjustifiable, then apply the result back upon one imperative, namely that of suffering. 
Shifting our focus temporarily to the justifiability of imperatives as such, we can ask, what feature makes an imperative, any imperative, capable of being justified? If the imperative of suffering doesn't have this feature, we could then explain why we can never justify it. And this would solve our frustration problem, or at least one of them, I suppose. Um, to solve it, uh, to solve this problem, we'll now appeal to a vital analytic truism about reasons. Uh, this truism, which comprises the second or rational part of the normative mechanism I'm trying to build, is a thesis about what any imperative must be like if it is to be possible to justify it. The basic idea is that the imperative authority of a reason, the authority to justifiably demand or impose, depends in part on the reason's general, gnomic, or law-like structure. So, this is quite abstract, but we can get an idea of what this requirement for the justifiability of imperatives is by analogy to the justifiability of institutional imperatives. Comparing the law-likeness of any imperatives, sorry, just celebrating for a second there, something, I'm not sure what. Um, so, as a piece of it, okay. Um, so we can get an idea by an analogy with justifiable but institutional imperatives. Comparing the law likeness of any imperative which reason evaluates with literal laws will clarify for us the form that any imperative must take if it is to be justifiable. Then we can ask whether or not the imperative of suffering has this justifiable form. So to the analogy. Suppose now there was a law that governed absolutely, but it absolutely governed only Mr. Kipling of 332 Murray Road, West 9. Then suppose this county or country was such that each and every law was just of this sort. The next law was only to his wife and no one else. The next solely imposed itself upon their neighbor. Its laws then demanded something utterly different for their barber, the mailman, and so on. Each law is an imperative addressed to only a single person, authoritative for only them. The formulation of such a law would be Quote, Mr. Kipling of Murray Road, and only Mr. Kipling, must, and then you fill in whatever the substance of the, the imperative would be. Now, having imagined this strange land, note how already, that is, without us yet knowing what these utterly particular personal imperatives contain, how such laws already seem to run counter to the simplest formal check of fairness. A check which has something to do with being under the same rule. A nation of laws is the opposite of this imagined country, or so we think. Such imperatives do not even seem to pass a child's sense of what it is or could be fair. So what does this strange country with its singular imperatives tell us? The imagined comparison helps us identify a formal condition for an imperative to be justifiable. Namely, that they do not single one person out, do not pick sides, and do not pick on a solitary person. This is the form without which imperatives cannot seem reasonable. The form is not personal, but general. Uh, the form we expect. Uh, the form is usually only that guy over there should. I ought or I must. That's wrong. Rather, we suppose the form to be one should, one ought, or one must. And of course here, you know, the Kantians can go to town and, and tell you more. So this is a requirement of minimal impartiality on an imperative. Uh, that it address more than one be able to govern more than one. To say that justifications are general and intersubjective or impartial in this way is not to commit us, like Kant, to an imperative or set of imperatives which govern everyone, but it is to commit to a universal requirement of some measure of impartiality upon every imperative. This impartiality, then, this singling no one out, is an indisputable criterion for a justifiable imperative. A degree of impartiality is structurally indispensable to what makes a must seem just. Yet once this analytic bromide about imperative legitimacy is granted, it is easy to foresee a problem conjoining, first, the normative structure of any justifiable imperative, and second, the imperative of suffering. It is easy to see a systematic normative conflict between the requirement of impartiality upon imperatives and suffering undergone as an imperative perfectly partial. Here, agony antagonizes rationality. Moreover, the conflict looks to rage in perpetuity, for neither the structure of suffering nor the structure of imperatives will change. There is, 
and can be no end to the perpetual opposition between suffering's imposition of an inescapable responsibility and the most basic structure of normative legitimacy. The edict that no authoritative imperative is legitimate unless it can impose upon more than one person runs and must always run headlong into suffering whose imperative subjects only one. So, all right, so uh, to conclude here, um, alterity becoming proxy. There is more to say here, much more. Um, of course, there's a lot of third party stuff, and, and there's objections that I excise from the paper. I guess that's the easiest way to get rid of them, right? Just don't mention them. Just, I'll stand up here and hope that they don't come up. But uh, so there's more to say. Um, but I'll close with a final question. We have an account of the face and its proto-ethical alterity, certainly. But we might ask, is this yet proximity understood as responsibility, where responsibility is understood in its later fullest ethical sense? For can't I fail to see your face? Must your agony antagonize my rationality? More simply, can't I, the skeptic, still ask you, how is your suffering my reason? By way of answer, we can return to the opening scenario. Moving beyond a clumsy and unhelpful empirical optics and attuning ourselves to the foregoing considerations, what must I really see as a reason? There you are, writhing still. I, skeptic, see you not merely being in pain, but having to be. That is, I see you not merely in pain, but suffering. Insofar as I see you suffering, I see a solitary singling out an alterity made of an imperative opposed upon you only. And the very particular nature of this imperative offends the minimum standard for any imperative which reason might justify or judge sufficiently impartial. Thus I am at once repulsed by your plight and drawn to undo it. Your subjectivity and its separateness strikes me as an unjust subjection. I see your face as, quote, the offense of the offended, and am offended myself on your behalf. And the very difference I once thought of as a reason to justify indifference produces in me a non-indifference to you, and does so long before autonomy, sovereignty, and the infamous detachments of an impersonal, disinterested, and defaced rationality. Uh, I must close. Uh, I've tried to show, uh, too briefly no doubt, what the face is, uh, I've tried to show how and why the face moves us as it does. Moreover, I've done so taking care to ensure that the authority of the face, both the poignancy of its plea and the power of its command, are not derived from reason, but an offense against it, the disruption of it. I present this to you today because I believe a reasonable account of the face is a minimal requirement for any lasting Levinas analytic rapprochement. But we know, of course, this end is just the beginning of Levinas' Copernican project, the aim of which is not to show the face to be reasonable, but to show how reason itself, in its fullest philosophical sense, is founded and grounded by a prior solidarity arising from the vulnerability of others. But we can, at least from here, at least see how an appreciation of this substantive, stunning confrontation of alterity, from which no rational skeptic can escape, might alter ethical discourse in both traditions we are here to discuss. We can see in particular how Levinas account of the face and how, so to speak, the face confronts or faces reason might diminish the urge to rummage in reason for ethics or rummage for reasons to be ethical. Such projects are not, on Levinas' picture, wrong so much as tardy. For to enter the space of reasons is to enter a space in which, quote, the face always already speaks. It is to enter a space which is not the space in which ethics is to be found, but a space with it which is ethical already. Thank you.
thank you. I actually don't know why I raised my hand because I have this really half-baked idea. Um, and I think I just want to sort of say thank you, though, because you, one thing, you kind of answered a question for me. Both, both presentations have answered some questions for me or made me rethink the role of justice in its relation to ethics here. But I always sort of thought about, you know, sort of justifying the unjustifiable, unjustifiable demands or sort of um, that ethics places on us. Or I think at the beginning, Kevin, of your presentation addresses the kind of problem of other minds that a lot of others in Western sort of thought are obsessed with since at least sort of Descartes, right? How, how Levinas really approaches that from a very different direction. And I've always sort of thought to myself, well, the self doesn't pre-exist the ethical relation. I mean, this is part of the sort of obligation that holds us from the get-go, right? And like you said at the very end, it's already a ethical space. But what you kind of gave us, I mean, in this notion of I'm offended, right? That I see the, the, the offense on the other, done to the other. This unjustifiable imperative, which already engages my reason. And that's kind of fascinating because what you're showing us, I think, is, is, is not just the birth of the subject, which Levinas shows us is, is born in its responsiveness to another, right? The subject doesn't pre-exist that responsiveness, but you're showing the birth of the rational subject. But in that moment, it's not just that I come up as this kind of like wellspring of empathy and, 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 and you know, emotional response to the other or something, but that I come up as a being who's offended. And I think what you laid out is that offense is only possible as a, as a, as a, as a rational offense. We're not offended for reasons that, that don't engage us as rational agents or creatures. And so I guess, you know, I think that was like, like Drew's question, more praise than a, oh, than a question right. there. I'm sorry, keep it going. Yeah, right, right. No, that, um, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, yeah, bolster me up my insecurities here. Um, so, so um, yeah, dude, just a couple things that, that came to mind while you were speaking. Um, and the one is, um, if you haven't read um, Cabell's Knowing and Acknowledging, you should go out and do it, because your life is less than it could be. Um, it's, a great, it's a great piece. And what he's really interested to show is that it's a little piece, a microcosm of his, major, his larger project, which is to show that our erstwhile epistemic anxieties are actually ethical in nature. So the problem of other minds is not an estrangement from, I mean, it gives a crap if we get, you know, something wrong in science. I, I don't know. It, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't disturb us as deeply as it would be if we were alienated from each other. And of course this gets spun as a problem of knowing what's in your head. And Wittgenstein helps erode that and, and some others. Uh, but Cavell really deals with it well. Um, the other thing I think this, um, there's a whole other wing to this project. Um, so Levinas talks about the reduction of the same to the said. Um, what I've done is try to start with the ethics and get to how it might underlie reason. But you can also start with reason and show evidences or traces of this ethic in it. And one of the funny things about autonomy is just how apologetic it is from the get-go. It's walking around hat in hand trying to account for its beliefs and its attitudes. Um, it tries to give an account um, as if there's a to whom that's already accountable, always already accountable. So there's something really touching um, and, and silly in its, its vaunted sovereignty because it, it's just too late. In the giving and receiving of reasons and justifications, there's a room that's justifying. Um, and so we can, we can uh, yeah, uh, talk about the, the, the belatedness of autonomy in this way. And, and so I think it gives us a, an advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much. So two other questions. I wanted to thank you for that as well. Uh, that was wonderful. You've really done some work for us in, uh, in uh, approaching a primer by which we can start to translate Levinas' insights to the, the analytic tradition. Uh, and my question is, is sort of more of a plea for a little bit of explanation, maybe a suggestion or a connection. Um, I wasn't quite, quite clear about how you, you didn't just employ the tactic of rationality uh, in pointing out how the, the, the necessary condition for the justification of imperative would be is that it's universal. Um, and I think uh, you might connect this to the Levinasian idea of substitution, and Simone Weil might have a hint for how this happens. What you said struck me as a connection to Simone Weil's uh, notion of affliction, uh, where what happens is that you find yourself at, at, at the prayer, at the mercy of necessary laws, of physical laws, whose form is precisely universal. Uh, the, the rain, you know, the sun shines on the evil and the, uh, and the good uh, alike, um, as Levinas would want to say. Um, so. But is the additional fact that can't require that, that uh, those necessary laws can't apply is what uh, causes us to fall under the form of affliction. Why is this happening to me? Is that 
given those necessary laws, as Nagel would say, there's an additional fact that isn't specified by, those, by an objective description of the situation. Who am I in that situation? Why am I in this particular place? And what makes me, this, un, this indefinable indexical me, uh, the person who is in this particular point? Um, and in some sense, um, when we ask that, uh, Sino and Bay thought that that called us to recognize the separate existence of another individual. Um, this seemed to me something like the logical move at the heart of substitution. Once you see that there's an initial unjustifiable fact from the objective standpoint, that this is me, I'm the person who's in this objective situation, you become uh, substitutable with any other person who's in that particular uh, indexical location. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, wor I'm worried. I, I was with you for, uh, until the very last part. Um, so let me, um, let me address that maybe in order. Um, the first thing um, that's interesting, I'm definitely going to look up the affliction stuff. Um, uh, when I was um, going through this, I was thinking too of um, uh, the Christian notion that um, omniscience asks, um, why hast thou forsaken me, right? Even omniscience, it does not an issue of knowledge is, is what's being put across there. It's, it's something, it's an expression um, that's inevitable. It had to happen, uh, but it's still unjust. Um, and to bury that under laws or rules is, as Levinas says in a direct um, critique of Kant, uh, quote, a primal disrespect. All right? There's some way that you're defaced, and, and that's not right. Now, I'm worried about the substitution as interchangeability because um, the regime of separation, right? Already there, Levinas has the body. He's got the body at the very center. That's the first part of the mechanism. Um, and of course, um, maybe we can sit here as analytic philosophers and do all sorts of neat substitute, right? Or put the brains in. We all should trade bodies, uh, for better or worse, and, uh, and, and, and do this. Um, I really think, though, that the, it wouldn't matter because the normative separation that, su so to speak, supervenes on the body isn't substitutable. So there's something that's not substitutable that draws us. The alterity is never dissolved, and precisely in this, so the normative mechanism doesn't work by, so to speak, overcoming this alterity. It is a response to it, and the whole mechanism runs like a, a, a you know, two poles of a, of a repulsion machine or a, a two-part you know, two battery. Um, and so you continually get this cycling. And then the cycling, if that's what you mean by substitution, then I'm completely with you. I was just worried about the... Yeah, the right. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a question which flows from that, and it, it kind of picks up with, with Bia's question and with Dave's question. And it's a, I mean, a question maybe which is personal because of the kind of departments I've worked in in the past, but it's the question of the sadist. And, like, <laughs> I mean, I, I wonder because this is. <laughs> oh, God. I'm, so, I'm just writing Drew sadism. Right. <laughs> it's good. So, but I mean, you know, it's this tension between ethics and uh, rationality in, in the sense that Levinas calls it, because, of course, I think Lacan points out very well in Kant uh, Sad, that there is a profound ethical rationality to, to, to Sad's movements, right? He can uh, deduce transcendentally his actions, he sees the writhing of the subject, and in fact, uh, his, 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 the pleasure is not in the writhing of the subject, the goal is to uh, rationally tame himself so that he no longer feels the, the writhing of the subject. Lacan writes that the goal is to have a disembodied arm that whips without feeling. So it's trying to overcome its already ethical sense of responsibility. So the normative goal of Saad is to overcome its primary sense of responsibility to the face. I mean, we can see that as a rational, deduced position in response to a primary ethical sensibility and vulnerability. Yeah. I, I just don't know what to do with these people. So. I, do you know what I mean? Because I, I think there's a sense in which we could say, well, isn't, isn't the sadist precisely a, a person who's attempting to work out a normative rationality on the basis of a primordial engagement with a suffering other? And we want to go, well, yeah, Lacan points that out well, but shit, that's a problem. I mean, that's not, a, that's not the response we want. So what do we do with that? I mean, it seems to flow from what you're saying. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I, I think there's a huge issue there. I mean, clearly... I mean, the, the, this is going to sound bizarre to start this way, but the nice thing about malevolence is it's very attentive to you as an as an individual, right? Yes, right. It's yeah. extremely it's extremely empathetic because it needs to feel the suffering you're feeling without suffering for the suffering of the other man, right? right? It's very important. You need to divorce those to be a really good sadist. I'm not saying this concerns you in any way. But I mean, don't don't write that down. But uh, um, so um, so of course the idea the, the first thing we want to say is to you know. Not to respond is still a response. Um, to whip without feeling is still a response, right? So you're on board that far. That's right. 
And then I feel like you're gesturing at something huge, which is the, the purported gap that was already mentioned um, in several papers between the descriptive constitutive account. Um, the Knox cigar can't not respond. It just can't. Um, and so we can do whatever we want. We can have whatever status. We can plug in any psychopathy that we like. Um, although psychopathy is an interesting case, I don't think. I think that's a great abnormal that shows that Levinas is, is onto something. Um, but uh, I, I, if I got up and started talking about how to get the, from the constitutive to the to the normative, I, what remark, was remarkable in this came up in Josh's paper is just how confident Levinas was. And it reminds me of the Fermat's last theorem of marginalia, right? Oh, I, I've solved this. Of course you could, right? Of course you could develop a normative ethics based on my description of um, ethical weight. But I do think that there has to be a connection between what he calls ethical gravity and, and the, sort of the physics, the curvature of normative space, and particular plots within that point. How we navigate is going to be based on what we think that gravitation is. And he does say that the main thing um, with regard to how this is normative, how is this description normative? He says, remember the description. And that has a certain gravity of its own. But I, I, yeah, I'm not going to solve that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great problem. Yeah.